Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Mooney asked me last night, what was Hochelaga of the Hochelaga lectures? Hochelaga, I believe, was the name of the Iroquois settlement that eventually became the city of Montreal today. I think the anonymous donor chose the name Hochelaga Lectures to reflect his father's interest in matters relating to Quebec. Originally, the Hochelaga Lectures focused, or the original terms of the Hochelaga Lecture, focused on speakers familiar with civil, civil law, and canon law to reflect the connection with Quebec, Quebec and the law. But over time, those administering the Hochelaga lectures have broadened the scope of the lectures to include a vast range of topics, not necessarily legal, sometimes philosophical, sometimes sociological, sometimes religious. So a whole range of topics have been covered. Today, we come back essentially to matters legal, but matters legal in a context of international comity, cross-border cooperation, harmonization, and we're distinctly honored to have one of the great experts, one of the living experts in the field, um, here today to deliver the Hochelaga Lectures, Professor Charles Mooney. The anonymous donor of the funds for the Hochelaga Lectures wished the lecturer to spend time in the law faculty, typically over a week, so that what would happen in normal cases would be that the Hochelaga lecture would develop, would de, would, uh, the Hochelaga lecture would uh, deliver two lectures, one typically on a Monday, let's say, another on a Friday, and in the middle there would be a seminar, workshop, some sort of interaction with students to enable students to get to know and the Hochelaga lecture to know students. Professor Mooney, has been spending time here at the faculty, and not quite a week, uh, but he has been spending time, a considerable amount of time, over the last two days, taking part in the judicial roundtable that has just been completed. And the faculty is very grateful to him for taking the time out while he's here to deliver the Hochelaga lectures, to spend time uh, to talk to judges and to talk to students, there were a lot of student helpers um, at the Judicial Roundtable, to talk to students about his work and about the work that judges do, especially in the context of cross-border insolvency. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce this evening Professor Mooney, and we look forward to his thoughts on the matter of harmonization and modernization of transnational commercial law, He's going to assess efforts to date in relation to that. He will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then he has um, kindly consented to take questions after his lecture. Professor Mooney. Well, thank you, Professor Reyes, and thank everyone at HKU for inviting me, both for the Judicial Roundtable as well as the, uh, the lecture. Uh, as Professor Reyes mentioned, we have had a Judicial Roundtable, and the judges are with us now, and it's the most time I've spent with so many judges probably ever, and certainly from judges from around the world. But of course, there was a conspicuous absence, and that was a judge from the United States because usually, you know, we're from the United States and we're here to help you, right? So, uh, so I thought I would give a little bit of flavor of some of my favorite things that have actually been said in courtrooms in the United States to give you a sense of, the, of what the atmosphere is like 
in, in the court. And the plaintiff's attorney said, well, what doctor treated you for the injuries you sustained while at work? The plaintiff, Dr. Johnson, plaintiff's attorney. And what kind of physician is Dr. Johnson? Plaintiff, well, I'm not sure, but I do remember that you said he was a good plaintiff's doctor. <laughs> okay, by the court. Is there any reason you couldn't serve as a juror in this case by the potential juror? I don't want to be away from my job that long. The court, can't they do without you at work? Potential juror, yes, but I don't want them to know that. <laughs> and finally, uh, well, that's enough. <laughs> Uh, today I'm talking about a topic that's uh, quite dear to my heart, but I'm going to focus first on, and that's modernization of transnational commercial law. But before launching into that, I, I, I want to just mention my initial focus is going to be on process. And it's going to be on the process of some critiques that academics have made of the processes that lead to harmonization and modernization, uniformity, if you will, of commercial law and related law. And they're academic critiques, and this is a faculty of law in a university, so I'm sorry, but this is going to be kind of an academic lecture. Uh, but process is messy, very messy, which reminds me of the comments of a famous humorist many years ago, but from my home state of Oklahoma, Will Rogers. And when asked about organized political party, Will Rogers answered, I'm not a member of any organized political party. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> and that was his response. And another example of something being really messy is the famous Scottish dish of haggis. And it's sort of a mixture of the insides of, well, we'll put that aside. But it can be a little messy. And it reminds me of what my friend Roy Good once said, told the story about the fellow who went to Scotland for the first time and was served this. And, and the response was, when he saw it, was, is this to be eaten? Or has it already been eaten? <laughs> so when we look at the process of making law, it's, it's messy, and we wonder whether or not it's to be eaten or has been eaten. <laughs> this is dear to my heart because I started playing in this transnational commercial law world in 1986 when I was uh, leaving my partnership in a law firm and going to the university uh, for the first time uh, to teach. And it was at a meeting at Unidua in Rome on a leasing convention. A wonderful project that never went anywhere, but it was certainly fun and delicious. And that was three years, lending, ending in a diplomatic conference where I represented my government in, in Ottawa in 1988. From 19... 90 to 99, I toiled as a reporter for a study and then a reporter to revise the statute of UCC Article 9 in the US, uh, a massive job. From 1993 to 2001, I was involved in the Cape Town Convention on aircraft financing for my uh, uh, government. Uh, 88 to 94, the revision of UCC Article 8. Uh, after all that, the Geneva Securities Convention. Uh, uh, currently, I, we just finished uh, completing a study group's work on a new protocol for the Cape Town Convention, the MAC Protocol, Mining Agricultural Equ uh, Construction uh, uh, Equipment. So I've got sort of a stake in these uh, projects. Uh, and that tells you two things. One, I have some experience. Maybe that's why you ought to listen a little bit. 
Two, I'm not very objective about it, and so maybe you ought to be a little skeptical about what I say. So let's just talk a little bit about my terminology. We speak of harmonization in the context of uh, the development of legal instruments that we hope will be widely adopted in the same form. And the convention, such as the Cape Town Convention, the Geneva Securities Convention, those are, in effect, harmonization projects. Although recent years have seen deviations from past years in that uh, it's been realized that one size does not always fit all. So a number of conventions, including Cape Town, offer an array of options that states can opt into or out of by declaration. Modernization, on the other hand, I refer to in terms of the quality of the law, in particular, I speak of commercial law, the certainty, the predictability, the clarity, uh, in areas where it's not essential that the law be the same, but it is important that it be discoverable and certain and uh, uh, clear. Both of these processes can benefit from institutions so that consensus and there's a lot of benefits, but I'm going to focus on the critiques of the process, and in particular, uh, critiques by uh, who are, are badly misguided in their work on this area. My thesis. Harmonization and modernization can produce good results, but not necessarily. Some areas more or less susceptible. I think the critiques fail to demonstrate that these projects should be abandoned or that should, we should quit pursuing these efforts. I think they're flawed uh, and reduced to quite simplistic models, something that's very rich and complex. And so I can critique their models, but I can also critique uh, their results. Maybe my most important critique or, or comment or thesis is that uh, compared to other alternatives, the uh, processes that lead to these transnational uh, commercial law uh, instruments and other products is far superior than leaving it to ordinary uh, legislatures. Uh, and I base that primarily on my experience with legislatures in the states in the United States as well as our Congress examples the fellow that noted that four years ago my brother ran for state senator. What does he do now? Nothing. Got elected. It's supposed to be funny, but that's right. <laughs> the legislatures are very difficult places to, to develop complex uh, uh, legislation, uh, and that's the thesis. But I think it's still good to criticize, to try to say what's a good project, what's not, and to improve the processes. So we'll talk about that. In the US, there have been substantial criticisms, in particular, of the process under the Uniform Commercial Code, as well as defenders. The first critiques I'm going to talk about is one by Alan Schwartz of Yale and Robert Scott, formerly of Virginia, now of Columbia, and they conducted some studies of what they refer to as private legislatures. And by private legislatures, they're talking about primarily the American Law Institute, which does restatements of the law, and the Uniform Law Commissioners in the US, which does uniform laws. 
code is a joint venture between those two organizations that came up with the UCC. Uh, they claim, first, that it's dominated by special interests. So this will give you some flavor of where we're, we're headed. So they must think normal legislatures are not, right? Interesting. They say there's an absence of checks and balances in these private legislatures. And let me give you a flavor for what this is like. In the draft committees coming up with the UCC and other uniform laws, you have for the UCC members of the ALI and members of the, you know, from law commissioners, maybe five and five on a drafting committee. You've got advisors from organizations like the American Bar Association, American Bankers Association, other organizations. You have observers, a number of academic practitioners who are attending the meetings and participating in all of the discussions. And you have reporters, as I was for UCC Article 9, who are charged with taking the committee's instructions and putting it into statutory text and then subsequently writing the official commentary. So that's the kind of group we're talking about. And then for final approval or interim approvals, the text is taken to the general membership meeting of the Uniform Law Commissioners or the American Law Institute, as the case may be, for discussion and tentative approval and eventually final uh, approval. So that's the process. Lots of involvement by lots of people uh, but it's private, it's not public. Once the product is done, then it goes to the legislatures. And then the effort by the Uniform Law Commissioners, I'm using that as an example on the UCC, tries to get the particular article or the particular revision passed in each state legislature. So the uniform laws are not uniform because states can adjust them if they wish. And they're not laws because they're not laws. But they're a law when they're promulgated and then adopted by a state. Uh, in Europe, an effort has been made to uh, develop the work of a European law institute uh, along uh, similar lines. Uh, lawyers, judges, practitioners, trying to improve the quality of the law. Uh, uh, but ultimately, of course, it's, it's the uh, government, uh, 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 it's the governments that decide what the, what the law is. Claim that private legislatures do not a log rolling, as I'll vote for you on that. And they think that's a bad thing. Quite sure why as many times as I've read it. Private legislatures are not political, so they need interest group support. Uh, again, not clear distinction between that and general legislatures. They think that the more generalists of private legislatures defer to the experts. Uh, they give evidence of interest group dominance that where there's interest group domination, we'll have precise, clear, bright line rules that reduce costs, reduce the flexibility for judges. They claim that the Article 9 process for secure transactions was such a process. On the other hand, if there's not such domination, powerful interests block anything from happening because they cannot reach a consensus. Uh, they claim that when there are competing interest groups, there's a strong status quo bias. They use the failure uh, of attempted revision sales article as an example of that. They think that without the domination, academic reformer influenced efforts will be made like me and we will end up with abstract rules leaving much discretion to the courts. And 
they think public legislatures are not so driven by the institutional features uh, and better foster resolutions and normative debate and better mechanisms for finding facts. For example, the Georgia legislature passed a law providing that pi, you know, pi is going to be even three. Forget those decimals. The engineers were not consulted uh, uh, on that. Uh, the Oklahoma legislature voters to subscribe to a newspaper. So I'll give you some idea. Well, what's my rebuttal? Well, I just don't think these dominant interest groups uh, theory is correct. They do not favor bright line rules that are not in their interest. For example, uh, validity of disclaimers of liability for personal Injury. That could be a very bright line rule. You can just liability, but I don't know of any interest groups that are pushing uh, uh, for that. Uh, they will favor some flexible, such as good faith and negotiable instruments laws. So for every one example we can find that fits the SNS critique, we can find others that don't. Article two doesn't reflect academic reformer influence process. It's the policy of facilitating common law judicial policy, the law of sales. It's the nature of the law of sales. UNCITRAL, a couple of weeks ago, July 1, finished its work on a model law on secured transactions. It has a lot say dominated, but, but it has a lot of activity by delegations whose principal spokesperson are academics, and I list them here. Canada, France, Italy, Japan, Korea, Spain, Switzerland, Turkey, UK, and US. It's academics that are speaking for those delegations the vast majority of the time. Did these products produce these vague, uh, abstract rules? No. So it's not the process, it's the products between a sales law and between a secure transactions law that results uh, in the difference. The claims that public legislatures are less influenced by special interest groups, I, I just doesn't need much rebuttal, it's just wrong. You can look at the United States bankruptcy code and it's a goodie bag of special uh, uh, interests, whether it be from shopping center leases to specific kinds of contracts. Institutional did not dominate the Article 9 revision process, but even if it did, their, their, their charges that it benefited them really fails to understand the process. It fails to understand that the lawyers present represented secured lenders because people had to know something about the law to be involved in improving it and revising it. What, of course, is that those lenders are making a lot more secured loans than they are secured loans. We were dealing with a specific uh, area credit uh, uh, markets, but these lenders had no interest in doing anything but making it work. Uh, I have never uh, been involved on numerous occasions in the discussions to select members of the drafting committee. Their claim that they're selected uh, for their expertise and not for other balance is just false. And I could name committees and the individuals and their email addresses who uh, were selected for geographical balance and for balance of their views. Uh, I've seen in a very technical revision of UCC to deal with 
is held by intermediaries, stockbrokers and banks. We've seen the experts educate Mission, who knew very little, if anything, and I saw them over a few years become enormously educated and informed and balanced in their views and challenging the experts at every turn about why does it need to be this way and why does it need to be uh, 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 that way. I could say the same thing about their uh, claims that academics favor reform as a way to get publications. You know, we just write stuff, right? We're all screwed up. That's much better for us than if it really works well, because, well, what are we going to write about? Again, just doesn't hold water. Uh, neither does their claim about a status quo bias. Most importantly, their models Failed to take account of the roles of individuals. Projects get done, and they get done in a certain a certain individuals with names work hard and have views and write and talk. They think make and if their argument makes sense, then they can prevail. Uh, they claim the Article 2 project failed because of a stalemate, but I can tell there are many other projects with strong opposing interests. Compromises are reached, and the statute is completed, and it's adopted successfully. Another friend, Ted Janger, has a little different critique. He claims that uniform state laws work for mechanics of commercial transactions, but not for issues he refers to as distributed, such as consumer protection and secured transactions or lien laws. Some people are preferred over others. Some are protected or less protected over others. He says if interest choice theory predicts that the process will be captured by special interests, then if the proposed rule is distributed and the, there's asymmetrical power, that it does not work well. So he thinks we should not have ideas that could lead to a race to the bottom, like allowing corporate interest to entrench themselves in the Delaware Law uh, uh, Conference. So he wants to look at ex ante anticipated process and anticipated race and testing whether we have a good candidate for harmonization. His implicit solution, leave it to Congress or let every state fend for itself. I think his examples with respect to Article 9 are unsupported. I think he misunderstands in his writing, and I'm not going, I'm giving you my conclusion here, and it's drafting and negotiating history. Uh, I think he's just wrong. Uh, the process was conducted on a consensus that secured credit should be made available at a lower cost, with fewer transaction costs. No one in the room argued that we should make it cumbersome and more expensive and less effective. Now, there's an intense academic debate here about secured credit. Because, of course, if one party is favored in an insolvency, for example, then other parties are disfavored. So the argument goes. But that assumes that without the instrument of credit and its priority, those loans would have been made. That everything would be the same. That 
we would all buy our homes on the credit card. But it's an empirical question, one which cannot be definitively answered as to its social welfare effect. But when there is a consensus that secured credit can lower the cost of credit, provide credit to business, credit that sometimes otherwise would not be provided, that that was a good thing, and that was our mission. At being the mission, of course we tried to be effective, and of course we tried to make with the fewest transaction costs as possible. That's not a flaw in the process. That's a flaw, if it's anything, in the assumption of what the project was. And I mentioned before, for all of these so-called interests of representing secured creditors, those same individuals and their clients are just as likely or more likely in a given insolvency case to be an unsecured creditor. Uh, this refers to the, the, the claim that secured credit necessarily takes from one and puts in another's pocket. Classic uh, example is that if an unsecured trade creditor, I'm speaking sort of from US averages, if an unsecured trade creditor that sells goods and services to a business on 30 day unsecured credit if they do business with a debtor for an average of nine months, then if that debtor is insolvent and they collect not one penny in the insolvency, they typically break even. They've made enough profit in nine months of business to break even if they get nothing in insolvency. So these are the kinds of creditors that are aided greatly by the secured credit that's financing debtor's inventory and financing debtor's uh, receivables, liquidity, pay those trade creditors when it comes due every 30 days. The claim that somehow the private legislature was captured doesn't meet the flip side argument that why wouldn't a, pri a public legislature be similarly captured, if not more so? Finally, Virginia takes the Schwartz and Scott model and applies it internationally. And this is the nub. He questions the benefits, uh, says that all of this international work is unnecessary, produces rules that hinder, not promote business. He criticizes deficiencies in the process. He thinks we should look for contractual solutions, uh, that reform could be better by reforming domestic laws than through these international processes uh, that we're helping specialized uh, uh, advisors at the expense of general welfare, uh, that the institutions involved uh, are technocratic, not democratic, and he wants to know if that really leads to good products. He looks at six instruments, the Hague and Hamburg rule, sea transport, Warsaw Convention on air transport, Uniform Customs and Practice on Documentary Credits, Unst Travel Model Law on Cross-Border Insolvency. Uh, and I note that CISG and Unst Travel Model Law were multinational intergovernmental organizations, not private legislatures, but he applies the same uh, uh, critique. And he then looks at the substance and says the Hague and Hamburg rules are specific and tightly drawn, consistent with the SNS predictions, same on Warsaw. CISG shaped by legal academics in the absence of a dominant interest group. He says that is, is similar and it's a hollow accomplishment because of the generality. Uh, the UCP on letters of credit says it's a, 
a bank produced instrument by the ICC. Uh, it's a trial model law. When he wrote, was not in effect anywhere, but it would increase the uncertainty. Uh, dominated by bankruptcy professionals. So what really emerges? Paul doesn't like these six instruments. And he thinks that if he could rewrite them by himself, they would be better. And so he would encourage more competition among national regimes. My rebuttal here is similar to Schwartz and Scott. He fails to demonstrate that, that these flaws were caused by the process. He proposes no reforms, so presumably he thinks we should just rely on other sources and not have these international harmonization uh, uh, process. Contractual solutions would be of no help where third party rights are involved, such as uh, in the model law or secured transactions. Uh, he claims international business interests are victimized by these international harmonization efforts. Provides no evidence that any business interests have complained or claimed to be harmed. He would leave a lot to national and subnational legislatures, which I think could be captured equally well. In my view, the UNCTRAL model is a good product. I've seen where it's worked and helped in cross-border insolvencies on a number of occasions. What he might say about the Cape Town Convention, which was about because it didn't exist when he finished, but he has something that demonstrably reduces the cost of that adopt the convention with the right declarations, get a 10% reduction aircraft from any XM bank in the world under the OECD uh, uh, guidelines. So I think he is right, and I think it's right to focus on the results uh, of the product, evaluate it on its merits, whether it's been successful. If it's good, then who cares about the process? If it's not good, then we might examine the process and see how it might have been improved. Uh, so I agree with that part. Uh, improvements in process would be welcome. One in particular I want to close by mention is enhanced coordination. On national law, to trial, do a great job coordinating with each other and coming up with instruments of quality, whether it be UNCTRAL's legislative guides and, uh, and the wonderful, uh, successful products that the Hague Conference has come up with. They are not good at they are not good at being needs in states in Africa and Latin America and getting them enacted with all the legislation that might need to uh, accompany them. Uh, I agree that less emphasis on conditions and on model laws might be an improvement. It's a much more flexible instrument that avoids reluctance some states have to give up some sovereignty in a convention. Uh, an organization with which I'm affiliated, the International Insolvency Institute, along with the National Law Center on American Free Trade Law, and I hope OHADA in Africa, an international conference to get in one room for two days, representatives of every organization that's involved in implementing secure transactions law around the world. They don't talk to each other. They don't coordinate with people working on insolvency. So I think that even thinking about a consortium of these organizations that would periodically meet and coordinate their efforts would be 
a good idea. All states don't need the same thing at the same time. One state might face a complicated comprehensive statute like the model law on secure transactions. Another might approach toward financing construction equipment like the MAC protocol will bring when it emerges from the process. So this can complement the work of the organizations that come up with the instruments. So that's where I will orderly critique have failed the process and their critiques of the results. Uh, I think it has been a worthwhile effort for people to look hard at the process and ask hard But the case has not been that we should abandon or of modernizing and harmonizing national commercial law. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Mooney will now take questions. If you might uh, just identify yourself and then ask your question. Or comments. Or comments, yes. Uh, yes, Patrick. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Mooney, for your presentations. Well, uh, I'm now a final year law student in HKU, and you have just mentioned about the difficulties of the states to implement the uh, international conventions that the hate conference has suggest. So I'm just wondering what are actually the difficulties and what are the um, actual problems that the state, why are they so hesitant to implement these conventions? Well, I mean, it's a, it, it's a broad A, a, a basis. Uh, is the lack of coordination, and by that I mean the what the need is is an effort to target states with respect to specific projects and to have experts who will be there to help them adopt them and implement them, to sell them, to meet with the right people, to educate them about how this could be a, a situation. And the people that come up with the instruments, these larger organizations, are sometimes regional organizations like the states or uh, for reconstruction and, and development, they are not always putting a high priority on these matters. And so I think, uh, and states that do want to adopt something, there's a tendency to uh, look for an expert and they find an expert, and even if they really are an expert, they have their pet statute, their pet approach, their pet way they want to uh, One person wants to market country, a version of English law from the 1940s, uh, because the person thought that was a good idea. So I think all in all, let me just say uh, the need to improve implement, implementation. Of course, there are other problems when you deal with Europe because that has its own problems and they can be very resistant, resistant to any reforms on a state-by-state -state level depending on the, on the area and the competency of the EU in that area. Yes, Judge San Gaspar from the All Philippines. All right. So assuming there would be harmonization of uh, principles or laws governing these various countries, to what entity should the enforcement 
uh, be accorded to? Should you, should there be reliance likewise on the various judiciaries, or should like there would should there be likewise a single entity to which uh, to which recognitions or enforcement should be accorded to? For enforcement purposes? Yeah. I mean, judicial. Oh, I, I see. So at the end of the day, uh, there would also be a reliance on the judiciary for the enforcement of whatever has been agreed upon in case of arbitration. Uh, I see. But is there is there a vision to come up with an entity international in nature likewise for the enforcement of this thing? Not to my knowledge. Uh, it proved to be in New York, and I wasn't able to attend the final meeting, having worked through all the working groups. However, but when the draft, when the law, model law was approved by UNCITRAL on secured transactions, one of the most controversial areas was whether to put something in the scope provision that says nothing in this law affects the right, any right to alternate dispute resolution. That's all it said. Nobody said, oh, something in this law affects it, because nobody believed it affected. But there was opposition to even mentioning the subject out of concern that somehow it was going to have negative or positive implications on something. So we got that in, that reference, to send a signal to the world that insecure transactions there may be a role for alternative dispute, re dispute resolution, at least on two-party issues, and by consent on certain third-party issues. So that's a very touchy uh, uh, issue. I, I think we've learned from uh, the sovereign debt debates over the years that uh, we have to be very careful about approaches that would cause countries to cede their sovereignty uh, to an international tribunal. And so that can work, it might not work, but we have to do it very, very carefully. Uh, but finally, and I think what, what your, your question raises most importantly, we can have the best law on secured financing on the books if a country does not have the legal infrastructure, access to courts, rule of law, uh, a, a way for disputes to be uh, resolved, you know, those laws are not enough, or at least they're not going to do what they're supposed to do. So I, I think at least the, the World Bank in its effort tries to put and this effort tries to put some emphasis to say, you not only need these laws, but you know you need a functioning judicial system as well to make them uh, enforceable. Other questions? Yes, uh, Justice Edith Abdullah. Uh, Professor, we had a bit of a discussion in Singapore about the uh, likelihood of uh, harmonization occurring in Asia in terms of commercial law and we've had feedback from some business owners, some businesses that really in the developing world in Asia, the emphasis shouldn't really be on harmonization as such but on trying to ensure that there is certainty in the law and that there is, a, as you referred to in your answer earlier, a proper framework. So in this context within, let's say, Asia or perhaps Africa, should the emphasis really be less on harmonization and more about initial institution building and harmonization might be something further down the road? Absolutely. And, and, and that's what I had in mind when I said I think we would be better off if some of the convention project, projects in the past had been formulated as model laws. But to go even further down that direction and to take the, 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 uh, the two areas I know the best in solvency law and secure transactions law. I think we law and the Cape Town Convention 
some of these successful laws. Now start putting them the other way. Some of you may be familiar with the uni draw of principles, you know, general principles that you can incorporate into a contract. But we ought to have general bullet point principles of secured transactions law and say, this is what you should be shooting for. Now, you can do it by modifying your civil code and creating a registry, or there's a lot of ways to do it. All we want is certainty, coverage of all types of personal property, coverage of future assets, public notice through a registry. You know, with this list and say, get that done. Here, the statutory text that you can use for pieces of it, but make it your own. Fit it into your commercial code. Fit it into your civil code. I think you're exactly right. Doesn't need to be harmonized. Perhaps just following on uh, Patrick's question earlier, um, in terms of the Hague Conference, uh, Hague Conference's convention on um, securities held by intermediaries, um, how would you suggest, in line with what you've just been talking about, one should try, or the Hague Conference should try to implement or to um, convince countries, particularly in Asia, to implement uh, the convention. You talked about one of the problems being uh, these organizations, including the Hague Conference, not going out to the grass, I think uh, you put it, um, uh, to, to try to... Um, in the weeds. In the weeds, that's right. <laughs> in the point. weeds to um, try to encourage um, countries, jurisdictions, target jurisdictions to accede to, its convention, to these conventions. What do you think the Hague Conference should be doing? Because as you know, the Hague Conference has opened an Asia-Pacific regional office here in Hong Kong. That's supposed to do exactly that. Uh, go, I, I, I still prefer to use the words grass or grassroots rather than weeds. Um, go out to the grassroots and try to convince, persuade countries in the Asia-Pacific to accede to certain conventions. Uh, and um, in terms of model laws, well, the Hague Conference has, moved, has begun to move towards um, promulgating soft instruments, principles, not just conventions. Uh, what, what more do you think the Hague Conference should be doing? Well, first, not, not being able to control myself in noting that in my country, both grass and weeds is a, refers to a controlled substance. Uh, I think on the specifics of the Hague Securities Conference, on which we had a conference in Tokyo, and several of us here were participated a couple of weeks ago. Because it's not yet in effect, we hope it will be shortly if the US ratifies it, which looks like it will happen, we hope. Nonetheless, it's not. And I think as a political matter, if I were advising the Hague Conference, I would say, don't put all your eggs in this convention basket. Be realistic. Publicly acknowledge and encourage states that this, after all, is private international law. The whole subject, the entire subject, is what should a domestic court do. And a state's law can tell that court what to do, what the choice of law is. So I would not worry about the convention, and I would embrace states that wish to adopt the principles of the convention into their domestic law without ratifying. Similar to what Mauritius has done with the Securities Convention. Yes. So uh, it seems to me that that is. Uh, uh, an, an approach. Uh, we're facing the uh, right now. The, the model law include intermediated securities, securities held with intermediaries, which of course are the most important securities in the world when you look at the markets. 
That's because UNIDWA had that covered in the Geneva Securities Convention. So there's this huge gap. Uh, the International Insolvency Institute is going to write an, an annex that would take substance of the Geneva put it in model law text so that if a state adopts the model law, use this annex in intermediated security. I say example, treat that Law publicly because they've got a convention product. And I think everybody ought to just relax a little bit and say, we all have the same job. Inspire a state with our product to domestic law to look like our convention, or victory, and say we've, we've done a good thing. So that effectively what you're saying is, take something like the Hague Securities Convention, you can treat that as a model law, and you can, one can try to persuade states to adopt the whole or parts of it in an effort to improve, modernize their private international law. Now, one needn't look at it as an all or nothing, it's just the convention, right. or it may even be that one takes the parts of the Hague Convention as model law, parts of the UNIDWA principles, parts of something else in order to build, um, going back to Justice Abdullah's question, going in order to build institutions of private international law in a particular jurisdiction. That's right, because substantively, these international agreements don't add much to domestic law. They do bind a state to cause its to act in accordance, and, I, and I'm not diminishing that. But I'm saying as a matter of substantive business law, you can get the same results by reforming the domestic law, uh, uh, the terms of domestic law to what the convention provides. I think I will allow one more question. Is there any question that anyone here is burning to ask before the evening is over? Uh, yes, at the very back, Professor Kumiko Coens. I just, not really burning question, maybe not, but uh, would you clarify a little bit more about that consortium, you know, I mean, an organization is a, like a unidrawal is a more sort of reviewing of an unstral model law, or uh, I mean, uh, in vice versa, yeah. unstral is a reviewing that, uh, you know, a muck, like a Cape Town convention. And, uh, at the end, you are Im imagining that more like a reviewing each other than that. What kind of a sort of you are uh, imagining a picture? Would you clarify a little bit more further than this? Thank you. My idea on that, and it's just one of many ways to approach it, would to have the, the, the organizations that create products and the organizations that are charged with implementing law reforms in real states in real time. And some organizations have both as their charges to get together once a year to have a, a five year plan for all the states in the world. You know, or here's what we want to do in secure transactions. I mean, I'm just taking a limited. And what states have what? Which states need what? What's the best way to do it? Who knows? Somebody's there from the World Bank. Someone's there from uh, all the regional development banks and the regional uh, uh, intergovernmental organizations. People that happen on insolvency law reforms, so that in a way, communicating with each other in a coherent fashion, you could work together. Uh, well, we were going to do this project in uh, you know, Chile. Well, why that project? Why not this? This seems to fit better and actually have people 
uh, uh, discuss and try to work together in deciding what to do. I'll start is simply to have this everybody in the same room. Long these organizations have an ongoing relationship with periodic meetings and reports. Thank you very much, Professor Mooney. I think that concludes um, this evening's lecture. Uh, we've had uh, a number of uh, profound thoughts from Professor Mooney, things to reflect about, um, things to consider. I, I hope that we have all benefited from this, and I hope that um, Professor Mooney has enjoyed his stay here in Hong Kong. I believe this is the very first time that Professor Mooney has come to Hong Kong. He's traveled all over the world, but he hasn't been to Hong Kong for the first time. So let's give him another round of applause for that. And not the last time. <laughs>